The following episode is sponsored by Desert Operations. Two of the most celebrated military leaders in America's history gained their greatest fame during the Second World War, but both of them had in fact served, and served with distinction, in the Great War, George Patton and Douglas MacArthur. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War bio special about George Patton and Douglas MacArthur. John Pershing was the commander of the American Army in the First World War, but Patton had known him and worked with him before. In fact, Patton and Pershing had become friends in the pre-war period, and Patton's sister was even romantically involved with Pershing for a time. When Pershing was the commander of Fort Bliss on the U.S.-Mexico border, he was in charge of the revenge operation against Pancho Villa in 1916 and 1917, after Villa and his rebels had conducted raids on U.S. territory. Patton had received orders to report to the Philippines, but contacted Pershing. Pershing made Patton his aide and took him to hunt down Villa. Interestingly enough, in that year of 1916, Patton was to take part in the Olympics, though they were canceled because of the war. He had, in fact, taken part in the 1912 games in Stockholm in the first pentathlon. Patton was a brilliant swordsman and would not only develop new training tactics, but designed the M1913 cavalry saber known as the Patton Sword. He was born in 1885 in California to a military family and graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1909. He chose to join the cavalry after that, an elite branch of service, possibly because of his skill as a swordsman. In May 1917, during his first command under Pershing, he led a raid on the ranch of one of Villa's organization's leaders. With 15 men and three Dodge touring cars, he successfully led America's first motorized military action. Pershing nicknamed Patton the Bandito after this, and Patton got his first taste of fame as the raid was featured in major newspapers. When the United States Expeditionary Force was to go to fight in Europe in the World War, Pershing was chosen as its leader, and Patton went with him as his aide. Pershing promoted Patton to captain, and when Patton requested a command at the front, he was assigned to the newly formed Tank Corps. Tanks were a totally new concept for the U.S. Army, and of the Army, it was Patton who was the first to study them, then actually use them and develop tank strategies and tactics. The turning point for this was the Second Battle of Cambrai. Patton was not actually there. At that time, he was in Landre overseeing the U.S. tank force of some 344 tanks. But he studied in depth the results of that battle, which saw the British and French really use tanks to their full capacity for the first time. Patton and his tank unit would see action at San Miguel and the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. In the latter, the now Colonel Patton's brigade of 141 Renault light tanks and 28 medium Schneiders mounted a major assault, with Patton personally leading his forces into battle. Poor terrain and German anti-tank tactics caused two-thirds of the tanks to either break down or be destroyed. So Patton led a pickup squad of infantry in a frontal assault on German machine gun posts. He was severely wounded in the leg, and though dragged to safety, for him, the war was over. Two weeks before being wounded, then Lieutenant Colonel Patton had gone into a woods upon hearing that some of his tanks had bogged down. There, he came under German artillery fire. Brigadier General Douglas MacArthur saw Patton on the top of the hill and moved his division up to rendezvous. This was their first meeting, and they stood there under shell fire while MacArthur's men took cover, talking about the futility of taking cover. MacArthur, born in 1880, was a few years older than Patton. His family also had a long military tradition, and he attended the West Texas Military Academy before graduating from West Point with honors in 1903. Like Patton, he was an outstanding athlete. His military career took off immediately, and he had postings in Japan, the Philippines, Veracruz, and even France as a major in 1914, three years before the U.S. joined the war. A man of great bravery, he is described by soldiers and historians alike as egotistical, but there is no question that he was a great leader. 
When the U.S. entered the war, MacArthur was promoted to colonel and commanded the 42nd Division, known as the Rainbow Division, which was made up of troops from many National Guard posts from all across the USA. He would lead them at San Miguel, the Meuse Argonne, and at Sedan. After MacArthur and Patton had met, they led their troops on a daring but successful mission to secure the bulge of San Miguel. Patton's recounting of the mission is quite full of bravado, while MacArthur goes out of his way to subtly put Patton down, referring to the troubles Patton's tanks had with getting bogged down. Two weeks after Patton was injured, MacArthur's Rainbow Division went into action in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, tasked with eliminating the Klimhildestellung, a major defensive part of Germany's Hindenburg Line, and a real killing zone. MacArthur was quite ill temporarily after being gassed, but by October 16th, his men had taken their objectives and driven the Germans from the battlefield. However, they themselves had taken heavy losses and would be unable to continue to take the fight to the Germans. General Manoa wrote of MacArthur's and General Summerall's bravery on the Klimhildestellung. The indomitable resolution and ferocious courage of these two officers in rallying their broken lines time and time again, in reforming the attack and leading their men to save the day. Without them, the German line would not have been broken. I regard their efforts as among the most remarkable of the war. Post-war, Douglas MacArthur became superintendent of West Point, modifying its curriculum to reflect the lessons of modern war. In the 1930s, he would serve as chief of staff of the United States Army, and during the Second World War would become a five-star general and the field marshal of the Philippine Army. He is the only man to have that rank and one of only five to rise to general of the army in the U.S. Army. George Patton, after the war, focused on tanks. He used the lessons of Cambrai and the Argonne to write essays explaining how tanks were to make bold massed attacks to penetrate the enemy's lines and how to maneuver around fixed positions, know your terrain, use ground intelligence, and the object of war is not to die for your country, but to make the other bastard die for his. Patton saw tanks as the future of modern combat, but Congress was unwilling to provide the funds to build a large armored force. Still, he carried out experiments to improve intra-tank radio communication, reinforcing the importance of coordinated attacks and mutual fire support positions, all of which would be invaluable in World War II. In 1932, Patton led a cavalry force to break up a veteran's protest in Washington, D.C. The vets were protesting the denial of cashing their World War I service benefits. Many were out of work because of the Depression, and a government act of 1924 had awarded them war bonuses they could not redeem until 1945. Patton was said to be deeply unhappy with his superior MacArthur's decision for the policing action, but carried out his orders as commanded. But that, and all the fame, glory, and controversy that surrounded them during the 1940s is really beyond the scope of this channel. Today was a look at the early years of two truly iconic American military leaders and their service, experiences, and the lessons they learned in the Great War. Now, as I said in the beginning, this episode was sponsored by Desert Operations. Desert Operations is a free military strategy game where you can face thousands of other players for combat or trade, use a variety of strategies like espionage or trading, and unleash your full combat power to lead your faction to victory. If you want to learn more about Desert Operations while also supporting this channel, follow the link in the video description. You can also click right here for our bio about Crown Prince Ruprecht and Erich Ludendorff. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.